The real aim of this attack was to eternalize war, to prevent any possibility for decades of peace. What horrifies me is there are two narratives, opposed, radical, which in a, an uncanny, terrifying way echo each other. Those who now appear as the opposite poles are really playing a very similar game. What I fear terribly is that in the long term, all sides will be losers. Now is the moment for Israel. Yeah, uh, 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 annihilate Hamas, but at the same time, reach out to Palestinians, giving them some kind of a clear, clear program of hope. Slavoj Žižek, welcome back to Politics Joe. Um, for those unfamiliar with who you are, how would you like to introduce yourself? Ah, now comes a surprise. I still advocate communism. Mm -hmm. But what kind of communism? A German journalist asked me what kind of communist you are, and I gave an answer, a moderately conservative communist. Not By really. moderately conservative, I mean something very precise. You know, what bothers me with some leftist liberals, they make big plans, you know, let's do this new legislation and so on, but not with Rishi Sunak kind, but with authentic, their endangered species today, old conservatives, what even Lenin and Mao admired in them is this brutal realism, you know, in the sense of, yes, we can do this, but you think like crazy about what will be the consequences. What we, if we screw that other thing and so on and so on. Because isn't the standard even radical leftist game? Mm -hmm. Then you, of course, cause a catastrophe and then you blame the enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like what I call, sadly, in Africa, the Mugabe game. You screw it up. And then you blame, ah, because secretly the whites still control everything. And what is really breaking my heart is that now South Africa is approaching the same. So by moderately conservative, I mean simply, before you act, think well about all possible consequences. Because social life, here I am very pessimist, not traditional Marxist, is a is obscure, non-transparent, mm -hmm. complex. You never know what the actual result would be. So now you can counterattack me, but why then communist at all? To give you a very short answer, mm. it's a, not a communism of joy, uh, abundance. It's a sad, pessimist communism. Look, we are facing now three, four, five, I cannot even nominate them all, real, apocalyptic threats, mm. war, immigration, ecological threat, artificial intelligence. And I don't see any other way to cope with this than what I provocatively call war communism, an emergency state where I'm not talking about world government and state taking over. That would be a catastrophe, even worse. But mm. some kind of global international cooperation, not just this aesthetic cooperation. Yes, we must understand each other, but more forceful cooperation will be necessary. Now, when people tell me, oh, but this is total utopia, mm. I tell them, sorry, remember COVID, even Trump, had to do measures which come very close to what I call communism. You remember uh, every family got a check for $2,000 and so on. Stimulus checks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you remember how half a year before, if you, men if you were to mention an idea like this, all the neoliberals would say, no, this would mean ruin of our economy. No, it didn't. The good point about COVID epidemics was that it was made clear how much we can play with the market, do things independently of the market, and they don't necessarily ruin the economy. So again, communist, it means I sincerely don't see 
how to cope with the problems, threats that are on the horizon, without a much stronger collective collaboration, well beyond the limits of the sovereign nation state. Just to conclude, please allow me this. My example that I mention all the time, you remember two and a half years ago, uh, that crazy hot summer where uh, northwest of United States, southwest of Canada, Seattle, Vancouver, 50 degrees Celsius. Mm. Uh, uh, it was warmer than M Mumbai or Emirates. You cannot say uh, they should take care more of ecology. No, these are rich parts of the world. They did the proper measures. The problem is that the whole circulation of air around the North Pole is disturbed. So in this sense, I'm a communist in the sense of we have to prepare to some emergency state. Precisely because if we don't do it in a transparent, democratic way, then better not to think what can happen. But again, moderately conservative. Be careful about the consequences. I hate, again, this traditional leftist game of, yeah, yeah, imperialism still controls us and so on. Mm -hmm. So the reason we're talking is because of this book, What Lies Ahead When There Is No Future. You talk, the, the threats you mentioned there, yeah. war, climate catastrophe, <laughs> those things of that nature, that it's important that we have to conceptualise and understand these catastrophes in order to avert them. Most recently, and I think the most prominent example of any of those currently, is the war in Israel, the bombing of Gaza. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how we need to conceptualise that conflict in order to understand it and in order to avert the possible catastrophe that it contains, as you outline in the book? Uh, it's the question which I'm almost afraid to answer because it's all the time on my mind. Maybe you or some of our viewers know it. I, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Frankfurt Book Fair and I practically caused a scandal addressing this issue, all the big media, big daily newspapers attack me as practically anti-Semitic, supporting terrorists. Although the first sentence of my speech was Hamas did a horrible crime, Israel has the right to annihilate it, and all my but is, but we all know that in the background there is the unresolved status of the Palestinians. There are over four million people on the West Bank, in Gaza, in Israel itself, in, uh, in uh, East Jerusalem, and they live in, I cannot by call it ontological limbo. It's not clear what they are. Even the name of the territory is not mm. clear. Is it, is it uh, as is for the hardline Zionist, is it Judea and Samaria, is it uh, Palestine, is it West Bank or whatever? Mm. And these people are in a horrible position. And without justifying the brutal Hamas attack, I condemned it ruthlessly. Now, maybe you cut out if you want this. I will, let me tell you a story which really hit me. I'm in close contact with Palestinians and with uh, West Bank, uh, uh, and not only West Bank uh, Jews. And they told me, you know why some of them, leftists especially, were so hurt by the Hamas attack? Because that uh, area of the famous, famous, terrible rave party where Hamas was doing the murdering at a kibbutz there, do you know that these were I don't know them, but I know people who knew people who were massacred them. These were the most progressive Jews. Yeah. They all the time had contact with Gaza, helping them, hiring them to help them. Taking them to the hospital and things like that, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. And this tells a lot about why did Hamas attack there. Not only because it was most practical, but unfortunately, because the real aim of this attack was to eternalize war, to prevent any possibility for decades of peace. Mm. And it's 
breathtaking how, with all absolutely unambiguous condemnation of Hamas, when I just said, but can't you see the terrible pre predicament of Palestinians who are now in one or another way under Israeli control? They are now explicitly not uh, treated as a second class citizens, whole series of things they cannot do and so on. And as I always mention this name, if you want a symbol of what Israel is doing now, Israel the state, I mean just the government now, mm -hmm. remember the name Itamar Ben Gvir, who was 20 years ago or when condemned by Israeli courts as a potential terrorist, racist, and so on. This guy is now, it sounds like a bad joke. Mm. This guy is now minister for public security or whatever. And it's, uh, I learned this from friends on the West Bank, how uh, public order is falling around, settlers attacking. It's slow but continuous ethnic cleansing. I think that uh, what horrifies me is there are two narratives, opposed, radical, which in a, an uncanny, terrifying way echo each other. On the one hand, I agree, there is the Hamas narrative, their leader, Haniye, who said message to Israel, go out, we will kill you if you remain, you don't belong here. But then if you look at the first principle officially published of the new Netanyahu government is all of Jewish land, they exclude uh, Judea, Samaria, uh, 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 Golan Heights and so on, is exclusively a Jewish land. Mm. So it's symmetrical idea of there is no place for the other. So uh, I think that the key point here is not to fall into this trap of Palestinians versus Israeli, but to see how those who now appear as the opposite poles are really playing a very similar game. And then I did something, let not lose too much time, which caused even more of a scandal. I warned them that there is in the West in the Western anti-Semitism, a long tradition, I'm not inventing crazy terms, of, you cannot but call it Zionist anti-Semitism. Do you remember that guy who shot 80, 90 Norwegian leftist, Breivik? Yeah. He says, he said, here we have too many Jews, throw them out. But Israel, it's a wall against Oriental barbarism, we should fully support Israel. You know who began this? I couldn't believe it. Reinhard Heydrich, the father of the Holocaust, mm. he said, he wrote, I quote, I don't know if it's in this book or another, there are two types of Jews. Uh, uh, integration Jews who wants to blend into our society and Zionist Jews. In the, uh, these Jews who want to integrate into our society, we have to get rid of them. But if Jews move to Palestine, we could have wonderful collaboration of them and so on and so on. And the same thing goes on now. Uh, Trump is doing the same. Trump supports Israel there, mm. but in the United States, you know, proud boys and so on. He is supported by explicitly anti-Semitic again. Uh, so, I will conclude quickly just with one point, which is important. I think to understand properly the ongoing war, it's to take into account its catastrophic effect in Israel itself. There was a moment of hope in Israel a couple of months ago. You remember that big conflict, hundreds of thousands of people opposing this new legislation, which basically abolishes the independent legal structure and so on. Mm -hmm. And this war now serves perfectly Netanyahu government. Now we forget about that and so on and so on. So what I fear terribly is that in the long term, all sides will be losers. In, in the sense that uh, uh, 
I am very sensitive apropos anti-Semitism. I recognize it, whatever it is. And I think the first thing that will happen is anti-Semitism was still now uh, mostly European and a little bit Middle East, but mostly European-American phenomenon. Now, anti-Semitism will become a worldwide movement in a totally disgusting way. It will be a new link in this series of what I call unholy alliances. For example, you remember what happened in Uganda half a half a year ago, I think, where their parliament, democratically, of course, uh, 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 imposed the most terrifying anti-gay law. Mm. If you are caught in homosexual act, the punishment can be death. Yeah. But you know how they justified it? A struggle against colonialism. And what I am so afraid is that anti-Semitism will be included into this series. Like, to be anti-Semitic means to be for, for the third world suffering nations and so on. This will be a catastrophe. Even if in the short term Israel wins there, mm. and I think this was the idea of Hamas, we may lose here, yeah. not they, they will escape, the ordinary people, but, but it will give birth to such a new way of anti-Semitism, not only in the Arab world, then the game Putin is playing here, mm. who is counting on this equation. Israel is like Ukraine, a colonialist, Western-dominated nation, and so on and so on. This is quite catastrophic. The only hope I see, there are reasonable voices, I'm in contact with them. Mm. Although we are politically not on the same side, and he doesn't go far enough, but, for example, Yuval Harari, that guy, Homo Deva, he said something which is very important. He said, there is no peace in the Middle East without Palestinians being allowed to live free, dignified life in their homeland. He meant West Bank and so on. And it's very important that he used the term in their homeland. This is also their home. So it's too utopian, but now it is growing stronger in Israel. This idea for which I was attacked as an anti-Semitic in all left Israeli media, you find it now, that now is the moment for Israel. Yeah. Uh, uh, annihilate Hamas, but at the same time reach out to Palestinians, giving them uh, uh, some kind of a clear, clear program of hope. Listen, here we can make a deal, you can live safely here, and so on and so on. To continue the theme of catastrophe, yeah. you've also described the Western response to the conflict as a moral catastrophe. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Oh, uh, uh, the problem was that uh, now it's getting more mixed. But this, you know, I was interrupted in my Frankfurt speech yeah, so. because uh, the basic problem was, but I even didn't use the word but, like, I condemn Hamas, but. Yep. And uh, as somebody says at the end of the debate, the word but should be prohibited now. Another word that should be prohibited, I was informed, is complex situation. No, there is only one side, it's absolutely clear. And you know where I see a moral catastrophe? Now, I'm sorry if I will become anti sound anti-German. I don't mean all of Germany. I mean the pre predominant stance in politics now. It's this one. Germans admit they did the Holocaust. And now, by pursuing radically pro-Israeli politics, they do something disgusting, I think. They think that by supporting Israel, where Israel is not right, 
West Bank and so on, they will somehow pay their debt for the Holocaust and so on. I find this something so terribly immoral. Another thing that I find immoral is also and at multiple levels. And I here only quote Yuval Harari and all of them. This, this is for me the true moral catastrophe where you posit a choice. Either you speak about uh, Israeli victims or you speak about Palestinian victims in Gaza. If you mention Palestinian victims, you are already anti-Semitic and so on and so on. My, <coughs> my basic insight here is, that's why I think it's a moral catastrophe, that those Zionist Israelis who mention in today's situation Holocaust are doing a terrifying, disrespectful exploitation of Holocaust itself. Holocaust, a terrifying, unimaginable crime, they use it as a stake, a jeton, to justify their poli politics now. Mm. That's why I think that, and did you notice this detail? That's why uh, so many people attacked me. I was very restrained and careful in my Frankfurt speech. All the positive people I quote that were Jews, even Moshe Dayan, mm. who how much more refreshing it's now to read the first generation, Ben Gurion, Dayanai, who didn't play the game, this is our land, blah, blah, blah. No, they said it's an impossible conflict, we know nobody is right, and so on. Not to mention Simon Wiesenthal, not to mention uh, my true ethical hero. If there is a person whom I would, to whom I would give, maybe, please, to our listeners, check it on Wikipedia, wherever, is Marek Edelman. It's a Polish Jew mega hero. He was a Bundist, more socialist Jew. He was one of the key organizers of the ghetto uprising, 43 in Warsaw. Magically, he survived it. Then he was one of the key organ organizers of the uh, Warsaw uprising, 44. Magically, he survived it. Then he remained in Poland, and he gave a wonderful theoretical explanation when later anti-Semitism under communism emerged again, he stayed there. And he, again, he provided a beautiful metaphor. He said, it's not what I'm saying, but imagine me as a stone in Auschwitz. Somebody has to be here to embody, not to talk about that memory. And at the end of his life, he wrote a letter to my Palestinian friends, where he said, I support your rebellion against Israel, of course, condemning all Palestinian violence. There is a great Jewish tradition, which is incredible. That's why I don't like this Western, this is the most disgusting, Western position, anti-Semitic Zionist of not too many Jews here, but you go there and protect our civilization. No, I like Jews here also. Wherever they are, they make a great contribution to our civilization and so on. Look, precisely because they were stateless, we cannot even imagine European modernity, enlightenment, and so on, without the Jews. The very idea of enlightenment universalism came from the Jews who simply, like, they were condemned to be universalist, you know. But you know where, that, uh, sorry, just one thing which may, you know, Netanyahu and others, when you ask them why is, that place, Palestine, yours. They said, it's look at the Bible, it tells everything and so on. But in a, the most ironic case of cancel culture, mention the Bible and you will be excluded as anti-Semitic. Once I did this. In a debate in New York, I think some Jews said, but sorry, we are attached to our tradition, look at the Bible. So I told them, I quoted him, I said, yes, let's look at the Bible. You know, Moses, 40 years wandering around uh, 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 Sinai, then up on the mountain, Moses dies, he already sees the valley, and then Joshua takes over, 
and what to do. And God's voice tells him, Canaan, Canaanites are down there. They are evil people. Kill them all, men, women, children, et, and so on. So, you know, if I were a Jew, I wouldn't insist too much on the Bible, you know. But to avoid a misunderstanding, I'm not here condemning uh, uh, the Jews, because at that time, let's be frank, Everybody was acting like this. Mm -hmm. We Slavs from some Siberian steppes, I don't know where. How did we come to Europe? By invading it and so on. Mm -hmm. At that, so I'm just saying that, uh, that uh, in the same way that we talk about invented traditions, we should also treat our uh, historical documents and uh, now I will make a very sad conclusion. I am very skeptical about this idea that originally religions are good, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, it's only in their political application that they are, that they are misused. No, you find a lot of horror and cheat already in the original. Mm. So I'm here much more of a pessimist. The lesson of this, I immediately conclude, sorry. The lesson of this is we are left to our own resources. In Lacanian terms, theoretical, there is no big other. By big other, I don't mean just God, but some global symbolic order which tells you what to do. No, we live in a very dangerous era where no reference to tradition or to science or whatever can tell us what to do. I'd also, um, in the tradition of kind of, you know, emancipatory Judaism, encourage yeah. listeners to consult the Wikipedia of uh, Dennis Goldberg, who was imprisoned on Robben Island, um, and actually separated. He was um, part of the anti-apartheid campaign in South Africa, and also in prison <laughs> there with Mandela, but of course separated from him because of apartheid, and so was alone in prison for the same period of time. Right, because he was a Jew or what? Because Mandela was, was black, right? And he was a Jew, he was white, so the- Ah, yeah, Jew was, was yeah. Because, no, I, I, sorry to interrupt you, this may be, I know the situation there very well, mm. you know. Even uh, now, in India, many people, many, some people, many don't know about me, hate me, because I killed, or at least, undermined the respect for another sacred cow there, Gandhi. You know, when Gandhi was in India, yes, he fought against apartheid, but only for the Indian minority. Read Gandhi's text, my friends, republish them now. He doesn't put in doubt the big separation black-white. He just says we Indians should be counted as white, and so on. The second thing, you see, this is what I mean, uh, uh, moderately conservative. Maybe you read it, I think I already used this somewhere, a couple of months ago at Birkbeck College, where I'm temporarily employed, there was a debate with a lady from South Africa, a hardline old ANC fighter, and I asked her a frank question. I asked her, in all our media, I read all the time about how South Africa is on the border of becoming a fail, on the edge of becoming a failed state, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to believe Western media. Please tell me how do I reply to this. And I was almost crying, so sad. You know what she told me? She told me that more and more the predominant atmosphere, feeling uh, in the poor black majority, poor, is nostalgia for apartheid. She said that now in memory, they remember apartheid as a time where, yes, they were second-class citizens, but if anything, the standard of living was the same, maybe a little bit even higher, for the poor black majority, plus it was a police state, which means there was safety. Now, Society is disintegrating. South Africa is, has one of the highest rape numbers per capita. You see, this is what I want the left to avoid. Mm. How these eternal stories, look at Latin America. 
Bolivia, but now they did not do a wise thing. They cut diplomatic ties with Israel, but till now I believed in Bolivia because I was friendly with uh, Vice President of Morales, Alvaro Garcia, Linera, and so on. They were 12 years in power without scaring too much the capital. They succeeded. The standard of living will up. And then you remember there was a coup d'etat against them, but they won again. So I, that's, my, uh, uh, that's my moderate conservatism. How to avoid, I will name just three names, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, where it was a catastrophe. The left has to ask very hard questions here. I don't want to be that comfortable leftist who organizes a revolution, a revolution fails, and then you move back to your academic post and write a thick book how, because of the imperialist uh, cunningness and uh, plot, uh, it had to fail the revolution. No, the left deserves some authentic success. Can we interrogate a little bit more the role of violence in revolution, in liberation struggle, whether it's, you know, as we were talking about the anti-apartheid campaign in South Africa, or, um, well, take any, any sort of struggle against injustice. The one we've been, in, we've been interrogating so far is obviously with Palestine and Israel. Is there an acceptable level of violence, to your mind, in a liberation struggle? I, I, no, 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 I'm not naive here. I know that in certain conditions, uh, if nothing else, a certain level of violence, paradoxically, creates the conditions for a peaceful revolution. I forgot the guy's name, I'm old senile, but a guy, a black guy, I think, wrote a wonderful book, I quote it, I forgot where, in some new text, where he says that, uh, look, for example, at American, uh, in the 60s and so on, struggle against racism. Uh, yes, Martin Luther King won, but it also won because it was clear to the white majority there. If there is not a threat of violence behind, Luther King wouldn't be taken seriously. You know, you did it. It was the same in South Africa. Yes, Mandela won, but because the apartheid guys were well aware that there was a much more radical orientation within the ANC threatening with violence. Uh, the most tragic example here, let's look into history, is Haiti, where, uh, I mean, the exploitation of Haiti till the Haiti Revolution around 1800 mm. was breathtaking. Let's say that profits from Haiti brought to the French state more than half of its income. But what I want to say is this. Revolution won. The first generation to Saint Louverture were very fair towards the whites. They just freed slaves, but their main worry was to keep the production going, economic collapse to avoid. Then the French, Napoleon is here the bad guy, he brought arrested to Saint Louverture, brought him to France, and slowly killed him in an abandoned castle, blah, blah. Then the next generation were more radical, violent. Uh, you know what they did? They, uh, I forgot his name, the successor of Toussaint Louverture, he simply gave an order to kill all white people who remained there. With one exception, that's true. Poles, Polish people. You know the story. It's one of the most beautiful revolutionary legends. It again makes me cry. When Napoleon sent an army to Haiti with a horrible order, kill all the blacks, he said, after the revolution, it's not just to enslave them again. Kill them all, bring new slaves. Then, when the French army was approaching the Haiti black army revolutionaries, they heard some singing, and they thought, oh, yeah, this must be some primitive uh, 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 African dancing. When they come closer, you know what they recognize? You know what? The black free slaves were singing, La Marseilleuse. And thousands of Polish soldiers said, wait a minute, are we here on the right side? 
and they changed sides. And so Napoleon won. But then the result of all this trauma was this terrifying order to kill all white people. Mm. Now you can say, you see, if you give them freedom, what happens. Ah, it's more complex because at precisely this moment, the new black rulers took over, imitated perfectly the, the French aristocratic system. They named counts and so on, you know. They, this violence served the establishment as a pure copy of European feudal aristocracy there. But Haiti nonetheless did something prohibited. And to, do you know that to be reintegrated into world economy, Haiti had to pay mm. to France as for the damage of lost property, slaves. Uh, in, throughout 19th century, it was at some point up to 80% its state budget. You know when the last money was paid to France? In 1947, I think. So it consciously they kept, but so I don't avoid your question. I would put it like this. First, my limit is uh, uh, if they are not well known as a gangster family or what, don't attack civilian population. Keep it to army. There, if the situation is really terrorist, I condone a limited amount of violence. But we should always be aware, again, of this uh, ambiguity that, you know, you need a violent wink so that violence should be more used as a threat to do the necessary compromise. That would be my formula. You write in but a... counterattack me. I want to uh, uh, screw you. I mean, you just uh, 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 agree. Do you don't? Uh, did I say anything that you don't agree? Please, I would like to. It's actually funny because large parts of what you said I do agree with. Uh, I... Fuck large parts. Go to small parts. <laughs> where you don't agree. I think there has. I think there has to be. You know. So let's interrogate sort of modern conflicts. The nature of modern conflict. It's asymmetrical always. Whether it's the British and American imperial forces in Afghanistan, whether it's the Palestinians against the Israelis. Yeah, but and to say, this case is and, a yeah, sorry, and, 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 sorry. To, and to say that the Palestinians should confront the Israelis militarily, it's essentially a death sentence, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's to say, yeah, and you can say, great, fantastic, morally justifiable, but completely ineffective as a tactic. And it makes me uncomfortable because what I'm essentially saying, what I'm, the, the, the place I'm left in is essentially justifying the attack on civilians, which is something morally, ethically for me, I find deeply distressing, deeply upsetting. And I, and I, but I don't see any other way in terms of you know, an effective military campaign, an effective terrorist campaign, the use of limited violence to achieve political ends. You know, if they attack military bases, they will all die. So what else can they do if not kill the civilians? And I, I find that deeply, deeply uncomfortable because yeah, like but, I said- Okay, now I will accept this totally pragmatic, ruthless thinking. But shouldn't have then focused a little bit more on some effectively violent groups of settlers or whatever, and not precisely that part which was closest, which was closest to them mm. in some sense. Yeah. I mean, uh, here I agree with you. Let's begin by this. The situation is tragic in some sense. You cannot propose a simple solution, and so like this is the formula, and so on. Uh, 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 no, I see your point, of course. But again, as you already pointed out, not only this means suicide for Palestinians, but in the long term, such suicidal attacks eternalize war, and I don't see then any peaceful ANC, Mandela, or whatever, arising out of this and bringing peace. Mm. That's what horrifies me, you know. I would even accept attacks, here we agree, if there is a hope for the they will serve the way the threat with violence was necessary to bring in Mandela, mm. to bring in Martin Luther King, and so on. Otherwise, I 
what really, as friend of the Jews and of Palestinians, I, I see really, it scares me, again, a new wave of anti-Semitism. It will, uh, I, I don't trust Zionists, but I also see very clearly anti-Semitism where there is one. And what I'm, again, what horrifies me is this identification of that anti-Semitism as the result of this war will be elevated into one of the main markers of anti-colonial struggle. Mm. Although, you know, again, I like to complicate things. The Jewish side is not clean here. You know, I did something cunning. I read Theodor Herzl, founder of Zionism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that he, you know to whom, good for his soul, he didn't send it. But you know that he wrote a letter to Cecil Rhodes. I did not know that. Asking him for advice, like, and would he invest money? It's addressing him in terms of colonization. You colonize half of Africa, help us to colonize mm -hmm. it there. Second thing, he explicitly flirted, Herzl already, with the Western, right? Using these terms of today's right, that a state of Israel, a Jewish state there, will beat an impregnable wall to, to, uh, to protect Western Europe from Oriental barbarism. Mm. So that's the mega tragedy of, of Zionism, that what the greatest victims of European anti-Semitism chose the way to oppress others there and got caught into this way. Here I, I hated Ahmadinejad, you know, the ex-president of Iran. I even at some point was prohibited to enter because there were some elections 10 years ago where Ahmadinejad won by cheating and so on, and I wrote some letters. But you know, when she said something that others also said, okay, Germans did something horrible, which Ahmadinejad didn't admit, but let's admit it. Holocaust. Isn't there something cheating in giving them the land in Pal Wouldn't it be normal for Germans? Listen, end of World War II, you also have a lot of victims, which means empty land. Give, why don't you, you who killed six million Jews, give him, I don't know, the city of Hamburg and so on. You know, there is some cheating in it as if, mm. you know, as if I, I borrow from you one billion dollars, and then instead of paying you back, I say, take that guy's money. You know, yeah. the situation is desperately complex. This is why this is not a pessimism. The starting point is there is no clean solution here. And as you know, as well as the word but, complex situation is a banned, banned phrase in this conversation, as you said at the beginning. Especially by this now rediscovered as totally pro-Israeli yeah. poly. Yeah, they, uh, you know, uh, 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 an article in, I forgot which German daily newspaper attacking me, uh, uh, said, uh, you, they put it as a title of their text. Uh, 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 Hamas has no context. Like, <laughs> it's madness, like, you know. Every mention of context is, but then I answered in, I think, quite, that even if we, it's more complex, just condemn Hamas. Of course, we should inquire into context, because, for example, there are dozens, hundreds of books of the origins of Nazism. Mm. And it's clear that there was a crisis in Germany, experienced by millions of people, economic crisis and so on, and Hitler profited from that crisis, offering a certain anti-Semitic narrative. And to many ordinary people, things were all of a sudden clear. You know, like, ah, now we know, behind all of these are the Jews and so on. So here is a nice example of how contextualizing doesn't mean justifying in any way. Mm. Evil can be radical, crazy evil but it's always a product of certain circumstances. It exploded in certain circumstances, like the same again in Haiti. 
the second generation who killed all the white people. Yes, I agree, it was horrible. But let's take a look at how breathtaking the exploitation in Haiti was. Okay. I will not go on. I talk too much. No, Please. not at all. Not at all. I think there's one other sort of area I'd like to explore on yeah. Israel-Palestine before we maybe move to... Sorry. That's a terrible omen, isn't no, it? No, 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 it's good. <laughs> Leave it there. Leave it there. That's where it belongs, face down yeah, on the yeah, floor. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm always <laughs> cynical to, against myself. Is that, okay. Or to put it in more humanist terms, books are dead objects. We talk like humans. Let's, the book. let's. Okay, so between the two extremes, the two totalitarian positions that we've discussed, the one of Hamas and the one of Ben Gavir and Smotrich, uh, that sort of not rich, yes, he is the other uh, hard, hard right Zionist position. But it's not just only Zionist. Let's be statistic: is that their solution is this land is only ours. There is no place for exactly Palestine. this this sort of greater Israel idea, right? Yeah. The, the expulsion of the Palestinians yeah. from Gaza. And if you look at demographic changes happening in Israel, the younger generation skew much more to that extreme right-wing politics. They, they skew much more towards the politics of the likes of Ben Gavir and Smotrich. And that surely means looking to the future, whether there's a solution, whether yeah, yeah. without sounding like Tony Blair, a third way, somewhere in between those two total extreme poles, because the Israeli population electorally is going to move towards that extreme. So if anything, the prospect of peace and a lasting peace seems further away than perhaps it ever has been. First, I would say something that may surprise you. I read a good analysis, leftist analysis, of the situation in France and Belgium. And they discovered the same thing there among these, I don't like the terms, quotation marks, pro-terrorist Arab immigrants. So it's not that they, uh, we were not open enough to integrate them, no. Most of this young generation of terrorists who did that concert call bombing, remember a couple of years ago in Paris and the so Bataclan, on. yeah. Yeah. Do you know that there are they are second generation? It's the same paradox that the older generation, their parents, were much better integrated into French uh, society. So uh, uh, I then the second thing one has to mention, I'm sorry it, if it will sound racist, is that a lot of this younger generation are East European Jews who are from Russia and other East European countries who tend to be much more aggressive racist than the, than, than, uh, the first uh, generation. There really is something very dark. This is the true dark side of the East European till 89 communism. For example, maybe you know the story, I spoke with a German dissident, I don't like him too much, but okay, he was well known, Wolf Biermann, a singer who emigrated to the West, friend of Brecht and so on. And he told me that in early 90s, immediately after the reunification, she went to some big ecological meeting in ex East Germany, and there was there a strong group of, well, to call them by their name, neo-Nazi eco people, mm. ecologically obvious. And he told them, but you are for Hitler. You know what answer he got? He told me one of the most terrifying answers that I got. No, we criticize Hitler because Hitler did some good things like getting rid of the Jews, but also he developed car industry, he built uh, 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 highways and so on, which was horrible. You yeah. know, this most obscene version. So at, uh, uh, this is what always surprised me that even now, even now, the right wing neo-Nazi parties are much stronger in ex East Germany than in the West. Mm. This is what, again, really makes me, uh, really makes me a pessimist, that what you described as something going on among the Israeli youth is also going on uh, among the Palestinians up to a point even in the United States. Look, all of these proud boys and so on and so on. Mm. And uh, uh, 
What really makes me afraid is that liberal democracy, the way we knew it, is coming to an end. Let's for a moment forget about West Bank, Israel. Let's move to the United States. I think United States is really in danger on the edge of the civil war. I forget his name because he's a disgusting nobody. Who is now the new House Speaker? Oh, yeah. Um, was it? It's not McCarthy, is it? It's... Um the new one, yeah. young one, yeah. But he's he like is, the the Trumpist. Um, yeah, but the ultra Trumpist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you uh, Trump is, we, I, I'll Mike, tell Mike you. Lee? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you after people like the, him and DeSantis, mm. we will even have, I predict, a nostalgia for Trump because Trump was very careful, you know, mm. not to pass a certain limit because this guy openly advocates violating the constitution, problematizing democracy. People notice very nicely that he never refers to the United States as democracy. He always uses the term republic. Mm. Republic in this Christian fundamentalist sense and so on and so on. So I don't have a good counterpoint to you. My counterpoint is much more sad, is that the whole world is moving in this direction. Look at the catastrophe barely avoided, if it is avoided. Remember a couple of weeks ago, the first round of the presidential elections in Argentina, where mm. I, again, I prefer to erase the names of really bad people, some right-wing liberal populist. Yeah. Again, he went to the end a nightmare. And I always use this when people ask me about freedom. You know, since I also published by Bloomsbury a book on freedom, and I try not to relativize the term of freedom, but to see many dimensions contradictory. He radicalizes this guy, something with M, the notion of freedom. Did you read? I couldn't believe my eyes. When I read it, I had, you know, I like this scene from old cartoons, Tom and Jerry. When you see something, uh, and your <laughs> eyes jump out and turn in the air. You know what he advocates? He said this is a new freedom to solve people from poverty, to give to poor people the right to sell their organs yeah. and their children. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this is liberal capitalism today. And so I, that's the cause of my Pessimism. Yesterday, at a debate on that strange place, I liked it, Royal Institute, you know. Uh, somebody attacked me along these lines with a very good question, no? Somebody told me, at, uh, uh, like, but your message is, we are fucked up, mm. no trouble. But you, in any case, you are old, you will soon die, so you don't care. What about the majority of young people here? Can you... Shouldn't you give them some hope? And my counterpoint was that his question is very ambiguous. Does he mean that, that it's true that we are fucked up just out of respect for innocent young people? We should give them some hope. I totally oppose this. This means patronizing mm. them. Or does he mean there is hope? Your analysis is wrong. And I would like to believe I'm, that there is some hope. My motto is the one from old uh, uh, Frankfurt School. Marx Horkheimer says this, apropos of Nazism, that our stance today should be optimi uh, pessimism in theory, optimism in practice. And I try to follow it. I'm generally a pessimist, but whenever there is a chance, whatever to do, I was engaged against Putin for uh, uh, for uh, pussy riot and so on. I, I'm, I'm in contact with, this may surprise you, with, uh, with some guerrilla group in Philippines and so on. Wherever, I quite uh, liked Aristide in Jean Bertrand Aristide in Haiti. He was dirtily manipulated by the United States. He was not a crazy Castro-like utopian. He was very modest, honest, but it was too much. So for a long time, I supported Syriza, mm. and I still am not sure could they... My reproach to them is, again, moderately conservative, because they complained how the European Union treated them. But what did they expect? You know? Yeah. Like, I, I think that absolutely use any 
of, in India. There I'm for Muslims engaged in things against the horror that Modi is doing now. Modi is playing the same game as Trump and the new right. Uh, some people protested non-Hindus that they don't feel safe. You know what was Modi's answer? Public. Modi's answer was, yeah, and it's good so, so that you will know that you are the threat of the nation and so on. It's literal falling apart of this basic safety of the public order. Mm. Now, in my old age, this may sound horrible to you, but the right is today the one which is more and more populist, violent, and so on. And I think, now I will say something shocking to you, it's an old story, but maybe, I hope you are not an idiot, not to you, but for others, uh, maybe the left should begin to use the term moral majority. Look, many people, I don't think they were most anti-Semites, who demonstrated here hundreds of thousands, and there are for Palestine, yeah. and there are probably many more who are afraid to. My friends, Israeli friends, are now arrested in Israel and so on. We should address them, we should maybe drop this violence, public violence speech, and no, my image of the United States is this one, with a little bit of irony, but I think it's true. Look, my old story, when uh, on the 6th of January, the Trump mob uh, uh, occupied uh, the Congress, yeah. my leftist friends were crying. We should have been doing it. This is our. I told them, no, sorry, you live in the wrong time. Today, the game, the rules of the game have changed. If we mean by postmodernism, this cynical relativism, uh, flirting with violence, blah, blah, then if there ever was a postmodern president, historicist, relativist, it's Donald Trump. And let's face it, if there ever was a person who embodies at its best this uh, moral majority, simple in a progressive sense, let's say conservative, in the sense of there should be basic decency, attitude is not Bernie Sanders. I think we should not leave all these voters to the new right. Mm. I didn't meet Sanders himself, but mm. I spoke with his ghostwriter, with some people around him who told me, Bernie knows this. He, Bernie said when there were elections, uh, Trump uh, uh, versus Hillary, uh, he said something ingenious. He said, don't worry about, because Democrats under Hillary fell into this trap. They worried about the middle. Will we, if we become too radical, alienate the, the undecided middle classes. Bernie said, no, we should aim at Trump's voters. Many of them are disillusioned, poor whites, and so on. They should be our, our target. That would be, if you ask me, my politics today. Just uh, finally, because time is short and you have to go, I, I'd also like to talk to you briefly about culture and about, well, some of the biggest cinematic releases that we've had this year. You've written already an essay comparing Barbie and Oppenheimer, and I wonder... Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> this, now, you really want to push me into suicide, public suicide? <laughs> they must be interesting movies, you know, because I haven't seen them. You yeah, know? of course, yeah. No, 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 I just like to read <laughs> reviews... And then react. And then react, you know. <laughs> okay, I'll make, I'll qualify it a little bit. I was tempted to see Barbie, yeah. because I quite liked her earlier movies by Greta Gerwig, yeah. you know? She's serious. She did some good things. Mm -hmm. As for Christopher Nolan, I'm ambiguous there. Why? I liked the, although, which was his last uh, Batman? The, the one where Dark basically... Rises, yeah, with, uh... No, what I like is the idea, although he's against it, that Manhattan becomes the People's Republic, yeah. <laughs> leftist terror. Mm -hmm. And he shows his cards there, that he is a reformist. But nonetheless, the topics were so daring that, you know, the guy played by Tom Hardy. Yeah, Bane. The brutal terrorist. No, Batman. He's there, the opponent. Bane. Bane, yeah. 
But isn't he the only passionate, sympathetic image in the movie? Mm. He really loves that uh, uh, woman and sacrifices his life for her. So uh, um, as for Oppenheimer, no, I will repeat what I said yesterday, something that horrifies many of my friends. You know, uh, I saw the movie later, not when I wrote the text. Mm -hmm. You know which part I liked, surprisingly? The political part. You know, all that... The committee. The, uh, In the committee. And committee, the, how yeah. they manipulate Oppenheimer and these double games and so on. Mm -hmm. How he is in advance sacrificed. What I hate, hate, is uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita. Because I mentioned this yesterday, read history of SS, Heinrich Himmler, huh. the most disgusting guy. Uh, he always carried in his pocket a special leather-bound version of Bhagavad Gita. Why? Because he was aware, Himmler, he was well aware that as an SS officer, you have to do horrible things, killing helpless, starved Jews. And his problem was an ethical one. Ironic as this may sound, how can you do it without losing your dignity? And his answer was Bhagavad Gita. You know, this idea of don't be identified with your acts, learn to act uh, at a distance and so on. So I don't like that reference to Bhagavad Gita. So you remember the first sex scene? Mm. Uh, uh, how can I forget? Heimer with uh, Florence Pugh. Yeah the communist mistress, not mm -hmm. yet the wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, she asked him or who, whom, I don't know, to read Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. And you remember there was an outcry in India. Yes. I agree with them, but in the opposite sense. Why? Yes, I'm against that because how could they spoil a beautiful sex act with a porno dirty book like Bhagavad Gita? You Jesus know. Christ. And I mean, I, and I'm not alone here. I'm not alone here with all my Indian friends. Sure. I, we agree. I, what I already mentioned, uh, the greatest tragedy in India was that around year zero in our ah. Christian era, you know, you know, all of a sudden, uh, Hinduism made a successful return and Buddhism disappeared. And uh, many uh, of my Indian friends, even radical leftists, respect much more than Gandhi Ambedkar, who was the great anti-caste liberal. Gandhi was never again castes. He just said, each caste has its own dignity. They are all children of God. It's the same thing as fascists are saying. Mm -hmm. Working class also has its proper place and dignity and so on and so on. So in this sense, I must say, uh, I enjoyed the movie, but I didn't like this pseudo-metaphysical background. Forget about that. Slavoj Žižek, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. It's been an absolute I am pleasure. grateful to you, and uh, uh, I'm very sorry, a uh, concluding joke, if you are still on, that uh, <laughs> I like, you are not active enough, because, you know, when people ask me about dialogue, I'm yeah. violent. Uh -huh. You know, it's my standard answer. Mm. I like dialogues, yeah. but like late Plato's dialogues, where one guy talks all the time, <laughs> and the other guy just says just every 10, no, no, every 10 <laughs> minutes, by Zeus, so it is Socrates, yeah. and so on. I like the, my favorite part of our speech today, our uh, dialogue, is that once I did provoke you into striking back a little bit, mm. you know. Yeah, I am. Um, you I, should maybe even, if we will have another opportunity, no, let's put it in this way. I cannot avoid obscenities, no? Yeah, of course. I would like to we go on well. Let's consider this an intellectual, not sexual, quickie. Yeah. And let's do yeah. another one more, you know. Like more the Kama Sutra, yeah. Kama, Sorry? We'll do the Kama Sutra version, yeah. Long, long form, yeah. But also, let's not go into yeah, it. Because with it, Kama yeah. Sutra, I also have problems, you know. <laughs> it's for me the ultimate book that ruins sexuality. <laughs> Slavoj, thank you so much. I'm, re I'm really grateful to you because I was told you were a nice surprise for me because yeah. I mobilized my small private KGB uh, spy service. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were saying, oh, he makes jokes. He, no, you are not an idiot. <laughs> Although you make jokes and so on, you, you have a mind, you know. 
that's thank you. That, very I mean, that's, nice. That's high price. price. Thank you very much. That's high praise, mate. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Okay, happy guys. Finito, finito, finito. finito. Bloody now, hell. Fuck you up, York, from the site or whatever. Oh, my gosh. My